Welcome to Kansas Fest 2018, everybody. And now, Roger Wagner. Oh, wait a minute, the lid's on. Give him a mic. We need that guy a mic. Give that guy a mic. Give that guy a mic. Oh, very good. Stranger in the night. I'm getting stranger in the night. You're working? Offset, but... Just keep an eye on it. Let's make sure we got the right guy. Yeah, we're good to go. We good to go? Dagan, this is for you. Where'd you go? I have my... Oh, there you go. This is for you. He said, and the only... The response I got was, he didn't want anything else, he just wanted that. So, here it is. Here it is. <laughs> and, and, and for those of you that are just really crazy, I have brought a few limited, limited edition. Pick a photo, any photo. Here, go ahead, pick one. That's yes. bad. All right. Just pick anyone. Come here. Free choice. Okay, let wait. Is it an apple too? <laughs> Wait a minute, is it that one? <laughs> Thank you. The crowd is happy. I hope you enjoyed it. That's be brief, be bold, be, be gone. No, they want more. Okay, fine. All right. So this is a, uh, here we go. It's, Story begins in a galaxy far away. Um, in a, uh, a, a way former lifetime, I was teaching junior, senior, high school uh, math and science. And the, uh, the school was actually a, I suppose you could call it deaccessioned, I prefer abandoned cavalry camp from World War I. Um, so the, the classrooms were actually converted. Um, I call them barracks is the word. Uh, so they were converted barracks for the classrooms. Fortunately, I had a, uh, what was the head, oh, so this, was, this was rural. This is San Diego up in the mountains. We had snow days in San Diego. Um, and this is, this is not auto shop. Uh, this is me supervising the uh, wiring going to a rocket, which we were gonna launch right next to the chem lab, because really, why would you wanna go very far <laughs> than, further than you needed to? Um, and so the, you can actually almost see this. This was the headmaster's house, and the barracks were back here. And they put me in that one, which was really good because then when I did my chemistry stuff, and I was talking to somebody here about some chemistry things, I started as a, as a in, in ninth grade, I met a, a, a seventh grader whose name really was James Bond, and he had converted his sister's playhouse to a chem lab, uh, which was primarily used for making fireworks. Uh, so. So, and, and then he said, you should read Lord of the Rings. So after reading that five times, I realized that all of Gandalf's magic was chemistry, and I went and bought every used book I could on, on chemistry from the 1940s and, be, and beyond. But anyway, we could, this whole, are there two here, or is it just my proximity to Mr. Speaker? It's your oh. yeah. No, don't, don't go, don't, don't do that, okay. <laughs> all right, just don't do that. All right, so anyways, that was Mountain Empire, and I heard about the Apple II. Um, and uh, somebody said it was really great. Um, and at th that moment, there really were three appearing. There was the, the TRS-80 from Radio Shack, the Commodore Pet, and, and the Apple. And uh, I went, went to, to the local store, and I thought, well, you know, I need a computer. I didn't know anything about computers. But if you're going to build a spaceship to go to the moon, then you probably need a computer. Uh, if you're going to be a mad scientist launching rockets from eighth grade classrooms, seems like you surely must need a computer. So uh, I liked the way the Commodore PET looked. Um, and uh, just this, this, a moment of destiny, how things unfold on very small details. So the Commodore was like 700 bucks, I think, and an, an Apple was 1,000 plus, 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 if you, if you wanted memory. So I went and I was just going to get the, the Commodore PET. And the guy said, well, you know, it's a very small keyboard, a chiclet keyboard, in fact. And I, I thought, well, yes, but real pioneers would not, would, suffering would actually build character. It would be, that would be okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I also thought about time by getting a motorcycle, but I decided a computer would be a better idea because you just spend money once. You don't have to keep putting money into it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly how it works. Yeah, 
Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> flawed judgment from the very beginning. But at, at the be at, it turned out that when I when I went in, the the Commodore Pet was off being demonstrated somewhere. They only had an Apple, and and I picked up a brochure, and at the bottom, it said dealer dealer inquiries invited, welcomed perhaps even it said. I don't know. It was very positive, and. I hatched a plan. My plan was to tell them I was a dealer, get a discount, and get an Apple II for the same price as a Commodore Pet with the big keys. So I, I called the distributor for Apple. Um, they actually had a distributor. This was by, this is all happening in 1978. Um, so 1978, I, I called the distributor and I say, I'm a, I'm a dealer. I'd like to. I'd like. And I, and I had a friend, the one who said I should get one. So I talked to him. I said, If we buy two. That'll be a quantity purchase. <laughs> and then we'll be a dealer and we'll get a discount and everything will be cool. So I called the distributor for Apple. And I think they were in LA and, uh, and said so I was a dealer. And, wanted, and he said, fine, we'll come down and look at your store. <laughs> <laughs> now there was a snag. So I, I, uh, I, I uh, broke down immediately. He said, I'm sorry, I don't have a store. I just want a discount. He said, well, I have an idea. Why don't you go into a store that doesn't have Apple computers, talk them into being a dealer, and then, and then somehow they'll be so grateful they'll let you have one of the machines at their cost or something. So I did. I, <laughs> I, I got a cheap used suit at Goodwill, a, a briefcase left over from San Diego State University, got a tie that you'll hear about later, and uh, <laughs> went door to door uh, trying to convince them that computers were the thing of the future. You, this was the chance to get in on the ground floor. Um, I went into Olson Electronics, and I went into, this is San Diego, went into various places without much success, but I did find an Exidy Sorcerer dealer. His name was Mark Yaxley in El Cajon, California. And, uh, and he, he went for the ID. He said, I've heard about that Apple, and maybe, maybe we could work something out. So uh, Mark Yaxley and, and uh, whatever the name of the store was in El Cajon that sold the Exidy Sorcerer became an Apple dealer. And I started lugging an Apple in, uh, around to so remember, I knew nothing about business or computers, but I knew that Hangman and Star Wars were really cool. So I would go into, say, a dry cleaner. I would go into a, a, a business, a strip mall, you know, where they had all those little shops, the dry cleaner and the taco shop and whatever, and, and explain my vision to them. I said, can't you imagine what this is going to be like? This is just wonderful. And they would, they would you know, say, well, when you can show us how Hangman is going to help our dry cleaning business, but right now we're a little busy. So I had a lot of time. Oh, hold on, we need to put this thing on, on don't go to sleep mode. So, so I had a lot of time uh, and no knowledge, and so I started exploring how to, how to, make, the, I, how to, how to make this thing do things. Um, and, and, I, and then I discovered you, I, I could actually send in my little article about what I discovered to call Apple Magazine. Um, and so I started doing that. So this somewhere in the fine print here, it's got, uh, well, it's all blurry, you can't read anyway. But anyway, one of those call Apple issues, there are some early ones with articles by Roger Wagner, um, one of which my claim to fame is, and this sounds really cool when you're in a bar with people who can be impressed with a story like this, is publishing the first code to r scroll the screen in both directions. <laughs> Imagine how that changed the world. Yeah, you take you youngins take that for granted now, but call <laughs> Apple was the place that back in those days it was read once. That was it. Well, you just <laughs> read once and that's it. Um, and somebody said, well, you know, you sh you could sell this stuff. Uh, so the programmer's utility pack uh, became the first thing, and this was still in the times of cassettes of all things, uh, hand typed. On like a real typewriter, labels that went on cassettes that I got at the probably the Radio Shack or something, um, and put them in a Ziploc bag, and then had the the, the documentation, which was also typed on a real typewriter, um, uh, you know, duplicated. So anyway, the, the the routine, or I'm sorry, the the programmer's utility pack was based on um, on having written some code and learning. It actually would renumber basic programs. Um, so yes, and. However, remember, I knew nothing. So my approach, never, never use subtlety when a two by four will accomplish the same task. 
So I had, with peaks and pokes, I had one basic program renumber the other by just, by just working its way through till it got to what it knew was a line number, like find the token for go to, and then find the numbers after that, and then keep those in Applesoft variables. Well, it wasn't real fast, um, but the real rub was that, that in Applesoft, as it's stored, 99 is two bytes and 199 is three, so when you renumber upward, or downward, things have to move. The rest of those bytes have to accommodate that change. And that is really long to do with a big loop of peaks and pokes. Uh, so I had to learn machine language, assembly language. So my big accomplishment, I, I dug around and I figured out how to go into memory. I figured out two things. One was how to move a block of memory up or down to accommodate the number. And the other one was I discovered, which I thought was was pretty remarkable how to have two Applesoft programs in memory at the same time. Like this, like weird. One computer and two programs. I discovered that you could just fool it, which is, by the way, another major breakthrough in my learning curve was that you can fool computers. Today we call it hacking, but but back then there were these two pointers in memory that said where the Applesoft program began and end, and another one that said where it was currently running. So I discovered I could just move those pointers to another block of code. Um, so one Applesoft program was churning through through the other one. And so that led to at Roger's easel, which actually then <laughs> used blocks of memory that had low-res images. And it actually was a, a low-res paint program that would move blocks of what 40 by 40 um, low-res images in. So you could do slideshows and all kinds. But remember, this is like 1978 or 79 probably 79 at that point. Apple Doc was the big hit because once I could do, do all this, and this is still basic. So there was a basic program with a little bit of machine code that would make a list of all the variables in your program. That's all. And, and, and people were FedExing orders saying, I know the software is, is only $9, but I need it now. And I was <laughs> amazed that you know, they would pay FedEx fees, or I think a courier came by once. <laughs> or somebody working on something really important. And my, one of my memorable uh, registration forms for Apple Doc was from Herbie Hancock. So who knows what was going on with that, but he, he was. So, so then things started to grow. I mean, there were orders coming in for tens of dollars. Uh, <laughs> so, and I knew to be a real business, remember I didn't know anything about business, so the story has a, a, a turn. Um, in about 10 years, but in any event, um, I knew that a real business needed an office. So I, I got a, and that is pretty much the size of the office. I think it was whatever the smallest thing you could get that was about a 12 by 12. The office was not much bigger than a trade show booth, actually. Um, but I, I had my office, and I started sort of duplicating things, and then I started, I discovered that I could order from Germany custom like accordion disc holders, so then I could have a product line. Um, so there's still some of those around. I think, I think Chris has some. Um, and then, uh, then we, we, I started going to, to conferences, you know, where, where I have to use those tens of dollars to pay for a $100 booth and, and get a fancy vinyl sign uh, for Southwestern Data. And the name I chose because I wanted something that wasn't, that wasn't too small, like Rogers El Cajon, California software company, but galactic, you know, <laughs> enterprises sounded, you know, a little over the top. So I thought Southwestern, that's, that's you know, believable. So Southwestern Data Systems, that, the name is nothing more than that. And there I am coding something, and I think those very disks from that holder are sitting in a, in, in a, in a box I brought so that we could try and read them one more time. There are these, those attractive cases, by the way. Those are still available with, by asking the right person the right question. <laughs> uh, and I have them in 8-inch size, too. For, so for those of you who have 8-inch disk drives uh, for high capacity. And uh, I have the, the business look there. Uh, yes, I bought a tie. Apparently, he bought a tie, too. And then while that all was going on, Darth Vader arrived. So soft talk. and. <laughs> This is a weird story too, but I, I've had a hard time finding issue one. Um, and I think I, I bought one a long time ago, but the problem is I have the Indiana Jones storage system, archival, 
<laughs> so I have things, but they're impossible to find. So I'm, I think I might have bought one, but I haven't seen it in a very long time if I did. And I'm not really sure I did. I might have imagined it. And today, at, at the garage giveaway, after everyone had, had ravaged the space, uh, as I picked through the, this is all being recorded, right? As I picked through and stepped over the beer cans and empty whiskey bottles, <laughs> what was just sitting right on top was, was an issue one soft talk. Oh, yeah. Ah. So just so you don't feel too bad, it did look like the dog had both chewed and made his permanent mark on it, which is probably why it was still there. But you know, when you have none, then, then, then a ravaged one was still better than none. So, so that was kind of cosmic today. So soft talk, I started. This is this is the imposter syndrome. That's you know when you you feel like you're an imposter. Um, you know, I was. So I called, I was talking to Soft Talk and Margo, and, and they said, yeah, we're doing this magazine. I said, yeah, I love the magazine. And I said, well, I'm learning machine language. I can move a block of memory from here to there and back if I wish. <laughs> and, and they said, well, how about a column? How about, why don't you write a column on, on machine language since you know it? <laughs> <laughs> so I did. So I started writing the uh, assembly lines uh, column, um, and uh, and it was kind of neat. It actually, I, I, I since I had been a teacher, I knew that the the classic strategy is you only need to be one prep period ahead of your students. Uh, so every month, I just wrote what I had learned in the passing month. Uh, so I was just working my way through the different different commands and 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 finding things to actually use them for, uh, trying to always have some sort of some example or whatever, um, but that, and, and I'll just say in passing, we, we had this discussion today that I, I actually think that was a gift from God that I then ignored for 40 years, and, and to this day, I still ignore it, which is the best time to write a book is when you're new to the subject, not when you're an expert, because by the time you're an expert, you forget all the things that are hard for a learner. When you are the learner, it's, it's you know, these things that just, you know, like, what do you mean it's F035? I mean, and like your whole brain is melted over that, and the expert just has like a paragraph. Uh, they can be any numbers you want, no big deal. Now let's move on to whatever. So uh, assembly lines did very well. Um, I'm not even sure, but there were so many copies, Softalk kept sending me checks, um, which was really good. So that allowed me to, f uh, oh, I'm sorry. Not, they didn't send me checks for that. That was just for fun. But then they said, let's put it into a book. And that became Assembly Lines, the book. Um, and that was, uh, I think, 81. And uh, there were some, uh, Chris Torrance, uh, the, in th things, they say you can't stand in the same river twice, but this being here today feels pretty darn close to that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, cause he, and, and so Assembly Lines lives today as the, as the compilation, although I have to say, the only downside of that book is it has the errors removed. So the learning opportunities of the first assembly lines with the occasional error in the source code are perhaps greater, but you know, make do. Um, it was kind of neat when I found out it had been translated into other languages. So there's a German version for the assertive programmer. There's a, a French version for the cultured one. Um, and those, those, are, those are not easy to come by. Um, and then, uh, and then I decided, well, the real secret to my future is to become a publisher. Not, because I have to keep being clever by moving memory there. That's, that's eventually going to run out. So I thought if I publish, other, I'll find other smart people uh, and, and be the publisher for them. Uh, so I started running ads in magazines that said, hey, you got code, send us stuff, and we'll, we'll be your publisher. Um, a guy walked in named Peter Meyer who was, I think, a math PhD, or he was really, he was really a smart guy, but the part I always remember, he was also apparently the secretary to the High Lama in Tibet. Now, I don't think the High Lama is the same as the Dalai Lama, but I'm not really up on my Lama, so. But he was a very philosophical guy, and he was from Australia, not from Tibet, um, and he had, he, had, he had made this really clever idea that in AppleSoft, an ampersand will jump to a given location and start running some code. As long as it ends with an RTS, everybody will be happy. So he had done something that used that little AppleSoft pointer to say, great, 
I, I, I just bit, arrived from a call from a running Applesoft program from an ampersand. I'm now going to increment the pointer and read the name, like sort or invert screen or whatever, followed by parameters that Applesoft will also parse for you. You can even have an equation with five layers of variables. And Applesoft would parse all that and hand it to your, your routine and say, that the result's 25. Or here's a pointer to the string or whatever. And it was amazing absolutely amazing and I spent the next years of my youth while everybody else was saying I know let's write a spreadsheet a word processor right hit arcade game um, I was tapping away writing yet one more and another and another and so were other people there's a whole toolbox series that I, I don't have on the screen but uh, it was pretty pretty amazing and I, I loved it to this day and, and, and I just heard that there are other people that are our very own uh, our, my doc, doctor here um, loves the toolbox, and there. Any, how many people have used the toolbox in the last ten years? Just that. All three of you. Very good. It's, it's a, a limited audience, but now the rest of you know what what you've been missing in your life. It's very cool um, because you can you can you can make that incremental step. You don't have to know all this. You can say, I want to do one thing with with these marvelous inventions that are being created. The correspondent was a word processor based on, on pure brute force. Take a block of memory, put characters in it, and if you need to insert something, there's that handy move memory routine. Uh, so that, 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 that same routine got used again in a word processor, would, would, which, and, and there were no hidden commands. If you wanted to put in bold, then there was a, a character that said, start, start being in bold. And it didn't put it in bold. It just had, a, had a, a marker character there. But it was very fast and very neat. So anyway, about this time, other stories. You asked for stories, so we have stories. Um, I, I got a, a, a communique from Ken Williams at Sierra Online, who said, hey, let's do a rafting trip. He didn't mean Pete personally. He said, let's write to all the guys and girls, and let's go up to the Sierras and, and raft down a river. Um, so we did. I'm in there somewhere, maybe. Uh, that's uh, Carlston. Carlson? Uh, it's hard to say because they're so young, but um, I think that's Gary, but I'm not sure. Uh, that's Rand, is it Randy Hyde from, <laughs> Rand, yeah, Randall, the Randall Hyde from, from whatever. Uh, I, don't, I think this is a Sierra Online guy, don't know what's going on over there. Um, that's, uh, shoot, I know Steve, why am I blanking this all morning? I had no trouble recalling his name from Datamost. Oh, and the guy in the middle, that's, that's Gary Carlson. So anyway, we went on this trip, and the story here is in the course of the rafting, um, I remember being tossed out of the boat, or at least on, in, in the process of being tossed out of the boat by the, the tossing of the boat uh, on the rocks and the rapids. That's what you're supposed to be doing. And the hand of, of Gary Carlson came <laughs> and plucked me from death's door back into the raft. <laughs> So that was pretty cool. Um, so I don't know. So a ton more time goes by, and Apple says they're going to have a promotion where they're going to put a coupon in every Apple II computer sold at Christmas. Uh, I said, well, this is an opportunity. I just need a proposition. I need something that people who just bought family computers would say, well, of course we need that. We need a magazine for kids, an Apple magazine for kids. So uh, it was the Apple's Apprentice. Um, and it enjoyed a lengthy run of three uh, bi-monthly issues. Um, it discovers printing full-color, glossy magazines is not a cheap endeavor, and it can quickly suck all the money out of any reserves you had. Um, but it was fun while it lasted, and, and it turns out there is a... Um, where's Brian? Is Brian in the audience? Oh, right there in front of me, yes. Yes, okay. Uh, hold, oh, I could hold it up. Yeah. So it turns out that just in time for Kansas Fest, those three very rare issues have been re recompiled and, and put into a collectible volume of its very own. And he even actually, the, the, the graphics quality in this is actually better than the, the originals. He, he meticulously fixed things. And, um, and I will say, in, it's been 20, well, how long, 20 or 30 years since I looked at this in any depth? I was surprised by how much was covered in just those three issues of, of pretty neat stuff. 
Now there's there was another one here. I don't know if I can find you to read a passage. I'm going to use up the two hours very fast at this rate, though. Um, let's see. Where Uncle Bill's column, page 21. I said it was for kids, but that didn't mean I knew anything about writing or preparing content for kids, let alone legal liabilities. But it says, off we go. Hi, kids. I'm Uncle Bill. This column is dedicated to having fun with your Apple computers, making lots of money, becoming famous, and seeing what you can get away with while your parents aren't looking. <laughs> It says, also, I'll be happy to pass on several tips, hints, gossip, scandal, and whatnot. Uh, let's see. Oh, hold on. Oh, I should have st I stopped too early. Some of the issues you all will be interested in include software piracy, illegal entry into <laughs> bank accounts, electronic grade changing, and burning down your school with a modem. <laughs> Naturally, I'll be including tips on how to meet girls and tap telephones. So, That's awesome. That was the last issue, and <laughs> <laughs> but as you can see, it is highly collectible. <laughs> as, a, as a snapshot of its time, um, but things things continued to sort of prosper. Sorry. That go out. Yes, good, good. They, 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 they sort of prospered. Uh, I, Soft Talk kept sending me money from the sales of assembly lines, which would fund a certain amount of losses, um, and so eventually at. Uh, at one of the Apple Fests, I think this one is Long Beach, but I'm not positive. Um, oh no, this, no, this is because this is Paper Studio has arrived. Yes, so this is not the. So it might be the Boston one. Well, anyway, whichever one it was. Um, oh right, right before that is the moment. Hold on, there was a transitional moment between these two. There was all the money that cost. <laughs> Then there was the lack of funding. Oh, yes, I remember now. The IRS showed up with a clipboard and two people and said, can we just auction everything now to pay what you owe? Oh, no. Oh. Now, yeah, I thought, if they're asking, that must mean that I can choose my answer. <laughs> I went for no. <laughs> I said, OK. It turned out they actually were very nice. They were very reasonable. And I just had to know to ask the right questions. Like, OK, when I say no, how long before you show up with more guys and, and you know, the next things happen? And they said, about three weeks. And I said, OK. And then what happens if I, if I come up with cash? And they said, then you give it to us, and we go away. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so the, one of the guys that was working for me at the time, um, Garland Buckingham, we were selling Merlin. You might have heard of that. How many people use Merlin here? Oh, yeah. uh, more than the toolbox. All right, you guys need to get those Merlin school skills into the toolbox. But I'm sorry, great, yay! So Merlin was a popular product. And um, I don't know how he did it. It was like a Jedi mind trick. He called up a dealer and said, you would really like to buy a year's supply of Merlin, wouldn't you? We'll give you a big discount, 10%. I don't know what he said. But all I know is he walked in with a check for the amount we owed the, gov the government. Um, and the disaster was averted. However, it, did, it was, as they say, a wake-up call. So there was a year where I went back to no staff. I did tech support myself for a year. Uh, not that I hadn't done it before, but uh, so prior to this image, uh, by about a year, were uh, very lean times. Uh, they say a good education is expensive, and they don't <laughs> That doesn't just mean paying a university. Uh, it's the money you lose making mistakes. How many people have, how, how many entrepreneurs or would like to be entrepreneurs do we have here? A few? Come on, more. Now put those hands up with pride, right? Now have all of you perhaps once or twice lost 10 bucks on, on <laughs> tens of, tens? <laughs> yeah, so a good education is expensive. You learned a lot, didn't you? And, and they don't have a class in that. So anyway, so. So while I was going through the lean times, the Apple II GS came out, and people were still sending me software. And one person, in fact, this guy right here, Michael O'Keefe, sent me a paint program. And somebody else had sent some sort of a, a text editing thing. And then a, a guy walked, that's right, so what, this is, a, this is out of order, hold on. No, 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 no. Oh, right, okay, yeah, these are kind of, okay, so then we'll get, to, so. I'll get to the Hyper Studio story in a minute because there's something more. Next up, um, 
So this was a show, this is Hyper Studio, but this hasn't happened yet, so just, just <laughs> ignore it. Um, and that's Hyper Studio. And we did a kiosk with a Laserdisc player and a touch screen, and you could find any of the booths in the conference um, and information about them um, with, a, with a GS. With a, with a GS, a touch screen. This, uh, the top part of this here is a touch screen, um, a GS down here, Laserdisc underneath, and nice speakers behind here, like 20 watt, several 20 watt speakers, which actually is it's not bad. Um, so it was pretty cool. But that hadn't happened yet. That slides out. That group's out of order. We'll get to it in just a moment. Uh, however, a year or two later, 81 actually was the year, if Ken Williams could write a letter to his friends, I thought I could write a letter back to my friends. And I said, how about we go on a hang gliding trip to Mexico? What could go wrong? Uh, <laughs> So after the hurricane, uh, Jose came through and the software industry was wiped out in 1981, a little known part in history, and did not recover until 1993. Oh no, sorry, that was a different parallel universe. Um, so so everybody, everybody answered and uh, people from Sierra Online came and in fact, uh, Steve Wozniak showed up. And, there, and next to him is Burl Smith who worked on the Mac. The Carlstons are back here somewhere. Oh, the, um, sorry. Oh, there's Burl Smith and Andy Hertzfield. Sorry, the Andy Hertzfield, Burl Smith, uh, and uh, Bob Clardy, uh, Steve Gibson of the Light Pen. Uh, there's a Carlston back there. Yours truly up front. Some uh, Randy Hyde people over there, and I think that's one of the instructors on the on the left. So we they came and and, and it w we're that close. Steve Jobs was busy that weekend, um, but at that point you could write to everybody and they would actually answer. So we all, uh, so there's the, the photo from the Assembly Lines the Book with Bob Clardy and, and Waz and myself in, in Mexico with our cool t-shirts. Uh, we loaded up buses and hit the road and, and went down to um, uh, just south of Rosarito um, in, in, in Mexico. And uh, on the top here are, are bundled up hang gliders. And, uh, and hit the beaches. And I figured out the reason they did this is because they had a very, um, Cantamar was the name, they had sloping sand dunes that went quite a distance um, because the big risk is that some of the students would actually fly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, ah, I didn't know you could go that far out. <laughs> so, um, so the beaches went pretty far down and I, I actually believe that they, let's see here, let's, uh, oh that's later, but each of these has, well, I could just skip totally out of order, hold on here. There we are. So they had these big wheels on it that I just thought were, I don't know, for some reason. But I think they were loaded with sand. I actually think they had weeded down the, uh, the, the hang glider so that they wouldn't fly. But if you, were, if you were kind of level and the ground is falling faster <laughs> than you're descending, you would have the feeling you were flying until you got to the ocean, and at most you'd have to fish some people out of the surf. But, um, but anyway, it was pretty cool. And, uh, and, then, and then there was a, you know, we would, like we do here, we have the eating in the evenings, and we had shirts, of course, you have to have, have, to have shirts with uh, hang gliding things and cartoony stuff on it. Um, gotta find a good image of that. Didn't, but anyway, so we're all having a good time. Uh, there's me and, and the usual suspects, and there's Waz. Um, there's me being happy. Uh, there's the uh, Doug, uh, sorry, Gary, Car no, Doug Carlson on the left. There's me being happier. <laughs> <laughs> and at this moment, I have another idea. I, I, I say to, to Gary, Gary! And now he's, he's, he's like a, He's like a hundred air or a thousand air. Who knows? He's got all his hit games, and, and uh, he, they're just doing great. And I don't have any games because I'm just doing the toolbox and the routine machine and, and waiting for the IRS to show up after this picture's taken. So, uh, so I, I said to to to, um, to Gary, I said I have an idea. I'm going to do a game. I got I saw, got sent a game by a guy named John uh, uh, John Besnard, um, and and it's a really cool game, um, and, and it's where the aliens are the good guys, and the Earth people are attacking. So, and, it, and we're going to do it all in the alien script because it's, well, because it's from the aliens. So I can't write it in, in English because that would, that would ruin the illusion, right? 
So I said, but I have an idea. If you're going to play this at work, wouldn't it be really cool to have control B, the boss key, put up a spreadsheet? <laughs> So I will say, I have actually been in social settings where Hyper Studio and my various stories have no effect at all. They just, but I was speaking to somebody and I said, well, huh, that's kind of the bottom of the barrel, but I, I did invent the boss key. And then I, what? You invented the boss key? <laughs> Go figure. At the end of one's life, what, what, what will stand out? <laughs> and, and a humorous boss key at that. Yes, that's right. Uh, and so we have the alien mortgage expense and I don't know, whatever, but for sp <laughs> outer space simulations. Yes, no, yeah, negative. Yes, this would, this would be the port, what do you call it, portent oh. of what was to come. <laughs> so yeah, so there, there's Bazaar, and, and then I, I actually presaged the artist formerly known as Prince by having, you know, a, the name in the alien script. And now the problem was, because I ran a contest to decode this, we have somebody here who actually, yep, did it, and decode, I, you could win, two! Oh my god, you were competitors, and you yeah, still get along. Fun. So, so the, the contest was if you could decode the complete game, then you'd be in the drawing for an Apple II. And all the ads, right? Uh, I don't remember. You remember the rules, and, but that's because you, you entered too. it. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and yeah, we did. Because the, the remarkable thing about the game is that you just ran those ads completely in alien script with no explanation. Yes, there was a flaw in my marketing plan. See? <laughs> <laughs> Prince had some form of electronics that arrived, and he was actually able to send out his little symbol to people who would want to put the artist formerly known as Prince with a symbol. But in this time, that didn't really work. And I really was far too busy to be sending out custom alien fonts to A Plus Magazine or whatever. So, so I couldn't really tell people the name, because then they could decode the script and it would take the fun out of it. So I said, I've got to say, it's just called the Alien Game. And it, it didn't work. But it really was beautiful and wonderful work of art. And we had sobered up and went back to flying. Well, this is ground school. Uh, and then, and that's Waz actually flying. Um, so that's pretty cool. And there he is lugging the hang glider back up again. Oh, more time on the flying. Yep. There's a guy just to make sure. But every once in a while they'd get away. Um, there's me. And they're <laughs> not really very elegant, not exactly uh, the American Eagle, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> just a skinny guy with long legs headed for the sharks. But uh, there, oh, that was ground school, a little bit out of order. So it was fun. We, we, we spent a couple days down there, and, and, and joy was, great joy was had by everyone. Um, and uh, of course, in the evenings, uh, guitars appeared. And the reason I asked in, on, uh, in Facebook about guitars was at, at, a, at a Kansas Fest many years ago. Um, I think Bill Budge was, was here. And, and anyway, we got into a discussion of the, the, the correlation uh, between people who like computing and people who like music and found that we believe there was a high correlation. So there we are. There are the Car one of the Carlsons playing guitar and we're singing Kumbaya or something. Who knows? <laughs> Steve Gibson of the Light Pen looking very happy. Um, around that time, I thought Southwestern Data Systems, um, well, there was a problem. Somebody else had already named their company Southwestern Data Systems, and I considered a lot of different names, and we just went for Roger Wagner Publishing. <laughs> Nobody had taken that one yet. Uh, so that, that's about the time, about the time the name changed. And uh, so I've broken this up into four decades. Um, of time, and so next we'll, we'll pick up the pace a little bit, go to 1988 where that booth actually becomes, uh, Hyper C becomes relevant. There's, there's just something here I need to check on. Just, do you, could you say just a few words or something? Or not, just look, oh, just look mis right, mystified right. if you'd like. Oh, I'm just going to be right here. back, don't worry. All right, hold on, I just need to go to the restroom. <laughs> <laughs> Some enchanted evening You may see a stranger You may see a stranger Across the crowded room And somehow you'll know You'll know even then that somehow you'll see her again and again. Ah! <laughs> oh.
That's right, I forgot. Dragging on the ground. Uh, dragging on the ground. No wonder I couldn't hear myself. Oh, now we have a tide hanging on. Okay. We're receiving Morse code from the alien planet. Interesting. Okay, where, where were we? <laughs> that fixed it. So this is, now we're now we're around 1988, um, and and a guy walks into my office named Dave Klimas. And Dave Klimas says, "You know, I've been thinking of getting into this computer business stuff, this personal computing revolution." And I said, "Well," he said, "I, I said, what should I do?" And I said, "You're in luck. I keep a book of ideas." Every time I get an idea, I write it down in this little book. There's far more than I can do. And it turns out that really it, it takes a lot of work to do any of these. So, so I'll give you an idea. And if you can come back and, and have made some progress on it, then we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes. So I said, there's this new computer called the Apple II GS. Now, this is 88. Uh, the GS came out in 86. Uh, some of you may know, actually, strangely enough, Apple took the team that had done the Mac and put a number of them on the Apple II GS. So the GS is actually built with the experience of having built a Mac. So it had more memory, it had more color, it had a 16 stereo voice MIDI synthesizer built in, it eventually had a video overlay card. It was an amazing machine, and in fact, still is. Um, and for some strange reason, it could play digitized audio. It had some circuitry for doing the digitizing, but it was lacking one last little bit. Um, it, it, needed, it needed this part. Okay. Well, he's supposed to be talking. Well, it needed that part. Whoa. There we are. Aha. Aha. Although what he's saying, I could narrate too. But, but there's later on that I can't fake, so we'll see here. Is that when I pulled, is that when I walked off stage and yanked the stereo equipment all? Do they even say that word anymore, stereo? I feel like that's like a dial, somebody I know calls it Moses words. You know. It's a high five. Like a beauty parlor or beauty salon or something, yes. It's, uh... So we'll start over here on the left and I'll make my way to the right of this system. This is an audio input card which came with Hyper Studio and it was used for digitizing sound, and you could connect a microphone in there to record sound. So Dave Kleinus comes in and says, you know, he'd like to, he'd like to decide. So I'll look in my little book here. This GS came out. I have an idea. I want to use a speaker as a microphone. First, we're down there, already down the road of bad ideas. But remember, I don't really know hardly anything very well, but I knew I wanted cheap. So I didn't want a microphone and a speaker. I would use the speaker as a microphone. It works at Jack in the Box, they used it in the old days. Uh, so um, anyway, I said, if you can build a digitizer card for the GS uh, for under five bucks, then, then we'll move forward. We'll, we'll see where that goes. And the original idea I had was to do a circus game. So Bob Bishop was actually able to do voice recognition with binary input from the cassette input. Um, it wasn't really good, but like a dancing bear, the fact that you could do it at all was pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, and you could actually, oh, maybe the battery's going or something? Maybe that's it. Who knows? Let's All right. I think this guy's dead. All right. Let's see here. Nasplasiva. Oh, sorry, I have wrong mic. Hold on, can change to other... I can switch this part here. Okay, I think that's better. Thank you. So, <laughs> a smattering of applause, we'll clean that up later. So, uh, so anyway, so my original idea was if, if on an Apple II you could do voice recognition with just a binary input, imagine on a GS, wouldn't it be cool to have a circus game where you would have these animals just running around, you know, chaotically on the screen. But you'd say, up Simba, and, and eventually it would learn that, and you could actually control circus animals with, with some sort of speech recognition, and I thought it would be a really cool game. Uh, it didn't really work out well. The speaker wasn't a very good microphone, and I thought of one day and as an alternative idea, well, maybe I could do Timothy Leary and Andy Warhol's version of Hypercard instead. 
That turned out to be a better idea. Well, I don't know. Maybe I would have sold billions and life would have been different. But in any way, so he said, what are you talking about, Roger? Well, every software, every program entity has sort of a fundamental data layer to it. In HyperCard, that's, that's a database, name, address, phone number on cards. And you can put a picture in there, but the picture is secondary. You could attach a sound, but that's secondary. In HyperStudio, my thought was, why not make a multi-screen paint program? Uh, why, why not? There's memory for it now. So now the fundamental data layer is a paint program, not a database. Now you can put text on the screen. You can put buttons that go to other screens. You can even put movies. So we're running HyperStudio for, for this presentation. Uh, uh, so, so, that, so we end up going down that road. I had this guy that had just sent me a, a, a paint program and somebody else that had offered something else. So I brought together this team and said, I know, let's do you know, something similar to HyperCard but for the GS that's media-based. And the word studio then had to do with you know, like an artist studio, a sculptor studio, a recording studio, but studio is a common word for art, uh, not databases. So that's, that, that, that board changed, was the butterfly effect that had an immense effect on the world for the next 20 years to this very day. Uh, when I travel around and go to educational conferences or meet people, um, it's, it's, very, it's very satisfying and rewarding how many people encountered HyperStudio at some point as an eighth grader or a fourth grader um, and, and took a different path. So that was HyperStudio for the GS. It ultimately included a microphone um, and a speaker um, and everything needed uh, to create uh, multimedia, multimedia projects. Um, it was uh, reviewed in, in Insider in 1989. I found this, found, I didn't even remember that it was on this. I found this in the garage giveaway, and that's a fresh photo. Um, so HyperStudio uh, grew, and so at AppleFest, um, I started showing it around at different conferences. Um, you'll record the kiosks that were in the earlier ones that should have been here. Uh, so I actually started having a real booth, and uh, and a much smaller number of employees and overhead expenses. And the second, so starting in this decade, things started to grow organically. Um, I thought, oh, this is the Apple Excellence Award arranged by Matt Detheridge from Apple, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, Why well, look at that shirt? I think I've seen that somewhere. <laughs> Very familiar. The question is, how can it, there's a special energy field I use to preserve all of the artifacts, <laughs> as though not a day has passed. Um, although I think I should get my glasses, probably check the prescription on these. It's been 30 years. Oh, no, wait. Oh, no, I changed these back. I did change. Sorry, we're in a different decade. The glasses are correct for that decade. All right. So Booth and uh, Michael O'Keefe showing HyperSteel. Although I have another copy of the kiosk. That's good. Told you all about that. Oh, and that brings us to Kansas Fest. So now things are starting to cook. Um, this is a photo from 95, but I think the years I came were 92, 3, or 3, 4, and 5. But yeah, five. I know I'm, I have evidence of being here in 4 and 5 for sure. And I think there's some videos and photos to uh, document this. Um, so, and for some reason, my ties, like I, this was just a regular tie I would normally wear. But for some reason, the, the ties that uh, I was accustomed to wearing drew commentary from... <laughs> of the public. Um, and so ultimately there, there became the Roger Wagner tie contest. Now none of you here have heard of, of that contest, I know. You've never heard of it, sir, have you? You've never, you've never heard of that. So, uh, but, but contested, sir, would you stand to show an actual artifact of this decade that we're currently in through the magic of my time machine? <laughs> Yes, and, and sir, wait, say, we're not done yet. Would you stand again? And then have your assistants on either side, or one assistant, but enough to hold it out so that at least half the people in the room can see what, what is actually on that amazing tie. Now, it actually requires three conference rooms to accommodate. <laughs> now, I'm seeing file, edit, move, tools, objects. Is that a hyper studio? And if it isn't, just say yes, it is. <laughs> what? And card on the, oh, there we are, there, there, that, that sound looks good. Now, would you just flip around um, so the people behind you can see? Although I guess they're seeing, because it's knit, they're probably seeing the mirror image, aren't they? Now notice I've given them a mathematical challenge, 
which will result in the strangulation of the only witness. <laughs> uh, and for those of you on the periphery who were not able to clearly see, that would be the extended tie. By the way, in the cosmic way the universe works, did you and I communicate in any way that you should bring that to this event today? We did not. Right answer. <laughs> I give you the ten bucks later. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I hope you are as equally moved by seeing that I had your excellent accomplishment documented here as I am by having you actually appear, showing that I hadn't faked the photos. So now there, you may have also heard of the event called. What did you say? Wow, amazing. You all know about that game. So I did read somewhere, there was some, now it's a skill of great, as you know, great game of great skill, concentration, and agility, and humiliation thrown in for at no extra charge. I kind of like this bag, it says car troubles. There's, a, there's an artistic opportunity at any moment for combining the scene unfolding with the messaging on the bag. Uh, so, and, and here I am ex executing actually aerobatic maneuvers. Um, that's all totally under perfect control. It's all, all intentional. Uh, it's a, in theater, we say, send them down to bring them up. You know, you have to make it look hard because it's so easy. You just, just did it. Everybody would think it was easy, so you have to make it look difficult. I'm, that's why I'm just making it look difficult. Um, to prove that this goes back all the way to 1994 at least, because some documentation said 95, I actually have with me, is it? I didn't bother. Okay. I have with me, I'll have to see it later. I actually have with me the crown, the bite the bag crown from 1994. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, we have witnesses. I, I meant to put it in here, but I got distracted worrying about whether I'd have my presentation or not. Um, so, yes, bite the bag. And I'm not sure, but. I suspect that her crown is made from a bite the bag artifact, but I don't think it's actually the crown. Or it's from Burger King, I just can't tell. But. Well, but it doesn't really have the Burger King stuff on it. It's turned around. Oh, poser, never mind. All right. <laughs> All right, well, anyway, so here's the shirt, as they say, and I'm, I'm hoping that. Um, at, at some point, maybe we can uh, we can put our collective wisdom together and do an annotated, you know, multi hyperlinked version of this, so that you could hover over this with a mouse and and actually find the. There, this one's kind of cool. Whoops! Hold. It says next year it's just you, me, and you. So apparently, it's a, a grudge match for right <laughs> today. <laughs> Um, so anyway, so yeah, so that was on the GS, and then eventually the Mac, it took years. So the, it, the GS was 86, the Mac couldn't do color until 92 at least. Um, I get a little confused between when you could do color on a Mac for $10,000 and when you could actually do it on the LC um, at a reasonable price. But that's what made the hyper -C wasn't worth doing um, until the Mac could finally do it on color. Um, inspired by this very event. Um, I started in San Diego having Hyperfest. So it was like Kansas Fest, and including it was a 24 hour conference. Um, we had uh, people, people just like here, except for Hyper Studio. Um, and so, teacher, except we did teachers, the mo most users of Hyper Studio were, were classroom teachers. So they were coming and showing amazing things, um, and that went on for seven years. Uh, there was a mascot named Addie. Oh. Uh, Perry Rees, who was my mentor and taught me amazing things. Um, and by the end of the 90s, uh, mid 90s to, to sort of the end, um, Hyperstew had actually become the number one title in K 12 education worldwide. So there were Turkish. <laughs> so it had, there were versions in Welsh, Portuguese, French, Spanish. Um, uh, just translations all over the place, Danish. Um, it, it was, I, at the time, being young and, and uh, self-impressionable, I thought it was because I was brilliant, but in, in fact I was surfing 
more waves of good fortune that were all simultaneously happening. The internet had not quite arrived, but yes, then there it was. And I was doing hypertext and hypermedia. CDs were invented during the, t you know, or became available during the time of Hyperstudio, even though we were already doing CD-like content. Schools are deciding that it might be a good idea for kids to have computers in schools, but what would they do with them? I know, a project on whales. Oh, look, there's Hyperstudio. It's great for making projects on whales. Um, so I had some things that I'd like to think contributed to, to the positive energy and success, but I was, was in the end extremely fortunate. Um, but with good fortune comes paranoia. Oh, hold on, we'll get to the paranoia point in a moment. Uh, celebrating uh, the vast commercial success of Hyper Studio, I then went to the next logical step of promotion and advertising, which wow. would be sprint car racing <laughs> with expensive banners promoting the product. Crickets. But nonetheless, there was my name and it felt good. Uh, so I needed a bigger sign that moved. So eventually, this is the Hyper Studio sponsored uh, sprint car, uh, and the gentleman there is, I had a, and I'm wearing the official jacket, it's pretty cool, um, and, and actually the gentleman there would be my brother, that's crazy Uncle Chuck as we say, uh, but anyway, now Chuck's a great guy, so that's, he was the, the builder and, and driver of this, and you know, so it was pretty cool, was, times were very good, but, but there was this problem of paranoia, <coughs> so I was convinced that that uh, Apple and uh, uh, Microsoft and big companies would, would suddenly recognize, hey, if everybody in the world is using this software, maybe it's pretty good. And they'd put 100 programmers on it, and I'd just be out of a job again. Again? Again? Yes, again. So I'd be out of a job again. So um, I thought I should sell the company um, so that I, I wouldn't just end up with nothing. So I, I went around and I found uh, people to help me do that. My, the favorite story is from Microsoft. So there were like 20 people in the room um, and I did my demonstration. By the way, I, I did mention before I knew nothing about business. I still didn't, but, but later, years after this time, I started figuring things out. <laughs> of course, never listened to a guy that said he's figured stuff out. So, but but I, I figured out a couple things. But anyway, so I, one of them was, I didn't need to do a demonstration. There, it really was a napkin deal. The companies were in the midst of a giant growth plan who were buying anything that breathed. So all I had to do was hold up a box and say, hi, I have educational software, do you want it? They would say, we don't know what either of those words are, but yes, we want it. But I did a whole big show. And so I was up at my side, 20 people in a row, and, uh, and essentially, as I recall, of course, subject to the legal disclaimer that I may recall this moment totally inaccurately and mean no ill feelings at all to any company at all with lots of lawyers. Um, as, I, as I recall, what I heard was something like, well, if we thought there was anything good there, we would just build it ourselves, so have a nice day. Uh, so, but I found a buyer eventually, the company that owned uh, Howard Johnson, um, Avis rent cars um, oh, Universal Studios, and, oh, and Seagram's. Uh, they bought um, Hyper Studio, because you can see how all those things fit together. That's really <laughs> Mom, why do you keep locking the liquor cabinet in? Why don't we keep the Hyper Studio discs in there? <laughs> it was a natural sort of thing. So they acquired Hyper Studio, um, and, and I retired um, for a while. So hold on here. Oh, nope, 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 button. <clears throat> okay, hold on. Uh, excuse me just a moment. I, I think I had too much iced tea. I, I, well, and, oh, and I have to try to, oh, and I'm wireless this time, so I won't pull out anything, right? Okay, good. <clears throat> Anything, just no, no. Pay no attention to the yes. Summertime and the living is easy. Fish are jumping and the cotton is high. Jeez, it sounded like a better plan. Hold on. Hold on. 
There we go. All right. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Nothing out of the unusual. So. The Prince of Tides was neither about princes nor tides. Discuss. <laughs> Let's see here, where was my audience? Okay. I didn't really get to finish. Summertime, did I? But hold on. All right. Okay. Oh, no, it's fine. There we are. Imagine how many clothes I have to keep for how many centuries just to be able to do this kind of thing. So I was going to leave those off, but I like to see you, so I'll put those back up. But in the, in the, in the promo pictures, they're not there. So. So I did successfully sell a software company in the late 90s, not for billions, not, well, there were a lot of zeros missing from that line, but, but I, uh, I escaped what I thought was certain doom. Um, it turned out the doom never came. Nobody ever understood what HyperStudio did. Um, so they could never build it. In fact, so I was talking to somebody on the plane flying here, and they said, well, you must have had competitors. And I said, yeah, imagine, I'll tell you what the comp competition was like. Imagine that I sell coffee. And, and somebody says, says, I know, they're doing a great business. Let's compete with Starbucks. Let's make cupcakes. <laughs> and they do, and, and they do a great cupcake business, but it, it doesn't have any effect. So somebody else says, wow, well, you know, they tried, but they got it all wrong. Let's, let's, let's do stationery and envelopes and pencils, and that'll be good. So in the end, the secret of Hyper Studio was very simple. It was designed to be the best tool for student projects. A kid has to do a report on whales. What do they need? So every design decision was centered around how fast can it move? What, it's just got to be low friction. You've got 30 minutes to do something useful, and you've got to be able to, to do anything. If you want to connect to Lego Robotics, you want to attach to a scanner, no matter what you want to do, as long as it's in the context of doing a student project, then HyperStudio was designed to accommodate it. Other people would say, I know, let's do movie software, and we'll tell stories with movies, and now we'll make, and then they just went off, right? So now they're on an arc about doing things with movies. But if you happen to be able to do a student project with it, it was incidental. And somebody else you know, took some other angle. And, and, but generally, they were very enamored with a different paradigm, but their goal wasn't to allow students to do projects. So it turned out, that to this day, nobody ever duplicated HyperStudio, and I don't think they ever will, um, although that's a pretty big word. Um, but, but never did. So anyway, I, I sold the company. I, I retired. Um, and one of the things, I, I might have mentioned my chemistry story early, earlier. This was my lab when I was in uh, ninth grade, uh, when I'd met James Bond, and we started exploring the wonders of chemistry. Um, by, let's see, ninth grade, right, so 10th grade, um, by high school, my lab was upgraded a bit. Oh, by the way, this book here, that was one I found. It's from 1872, and it has pretty much on that page the recipe for the vial of Galadriel that Frodo used in the mountain uh, to illuminate while the spider Shelob was, was after him. How many people know what I just said? Yes, I knew I was here for the right audience. So it turns out that, that in this book called uh, Richard's Book of Receipts, because that's what they called, oh, I'm sorry, it's called, yeah, Receipts. What they really mean is recipes, um, which what they really mean is formulas for how to make things, but they use the word receipts, is how to boil white phosphorus in olive oil. Now, there's some tricky parts in the process. Those of you who may have heard rumors of white phosphoruses less agreeable property is like bursting into flame on exposure to air, let alone boiling it in a pot of olive oil. But it turns out if you do that, the instructions say you can put it in a little bottle and it's handy for reading your pocket watch at night when there's no illumination prior to reading. So you would pull out your little bottle, you'd pop, crack the cork a little bit, the oxygen would go inside, the whole bottle would start glowing, and you could read your pocket watch. You'd die, die later of phosphorus poisoning, but uh, but it was a great trick, and as a 14-year-old, 15-year-old boy, I thought it was great. So yes, I did boil up white phosphorus, except there was a problem. White phosphorus was very expensive. Red phosphorus was cheap. Now you can go to jail forever for just 
saying the words out loud. But, uh, but in any event, so I discovered I could distill red phosphorus into white phosphorus by building a, a flask, heating the red phosphorus. It would change to white. It would come over in gas form um, and then distill and then immediately fall in some water. But it would, anyway, I can see you're fascinated by that. Roger, no, we're yes. here to hear about the apple too. Okay, well, the part about that was when I started teaching high school, I thought it would be a really good thing to have my kids do because, as everyone knows, the thing you're excited about is what you want to teach a new learner. <laughs> and then I discovered that sometimes there are, there are steps that you did that you kind of forgot to tell the new learner. So the problem, this is all true. So, in fact, that, that, that scene of those kids in that lab, that was my lab and that was the kid in this story. Uh, the, there's a, an Erlenmeyer flask or a Florence flask. The white red phosphor changes to white. It comes over a tube. It condenses. It's still liquid. And now when it comes out the end, it wants to burst into flame. So that's a problem. So you've got a little beaker full of water here. And it only falls about that far. And, but it's in the water and everything's good. So I had him do that. I explained all that to him. And then I left the room. Oh. <laughs> oh, I, I explained it to him. And then... There was a noise, and I thought, damn, I forgot the part where the water level rises as the phosphorus is dripping into the little beaker, the, it displaces and the water level rises, and, and you have to remember to raise the, the apparatus or lower the beaker every couple minutes so that the water doesn't touch the tube, because if it does, if you're not heating the, this thing permanently, you know, just like perfectly with positive pressure, it's kind of oscillating. It kind of goes, it kind of breathes a little. But on the inhale, if it touches the water, it sucks the water into the tube, which is like a 200 degrees centigrade or more, which makes the tube really unhappy, but it also cools the tube, which means it sucks even harder. So it takes about that long for the water to shoot into the flask, which is probably 300 degrees centigrade. And even though it says clearly on the outside Pyrex, <laughs> I think there, they, there, there was a liability issue there for the Pyrex company because I can tell you when the water shot into the flask, it just exploded. So when it broke, there was all this, this vaporous white phosphorus. They didn't, oh yes, World War I, yes, it was chemical warfare. Yes, that was where I remember reading about that. So there was a, a, a lump and, and it makes huge amounts of smoke, which is why they used it as a, an agent in warfare. Fortunately, the kid was decked out with protective gear like a moon, like an astronaut, right? So mostly there was a big noise, and he said, whoa, what was that? And I said, well, did you remember to lower the beaker every couple of minutes? <laughs> uh, but at that point in the school they had built, they had a recycling air system. So unfortunately, all the smoke, when it went into the little vents, just came out in all the other classrooms. <laughs> But you only want to hear computer stories, so we'll just move on. So, but I'll just say, so, uh, and then what happened? And then what happened was they said, well, Mr. Wagner must be doing another experiment. They didn't evacuate the school. Apparently, they just went on. And I don't know why. The times were different back then. And, and we opened some windows and went on. Uh, so uh, anyway, so I, one of the things I wanted to do was return to my youth, as we all do, as evidenced by the fact that you are all here. Um, and I wanted to re recreate my, my, my chem lab from my junior high school days. So, and, and we have a witness to this, actually. Mr. Mr. Torrance has seen this. Um, but it's a little bigger than that, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so I had, a, I had a whole room. So, so I had a little bit of space. And then there was another wall in the room, too. So, so between the two, um, I pretty much had, had a really nice area. I never really particularly used it uh, except to do a couple things for the grandkids and whatever, but it was pretty, pretty fun. Um, and then I also, I was into collecting books, and so for about 10 years I owned a rare book auction house in San Francisco. Um, hold on, let's come back here. How are we doing on time, by the way? We've just crossed over one hour. Oh, good. And, and we're already, to, and, and this is going to go through, we're already to part we're already in the part three. We're the third decade already. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. So anyway, so I had a rare book auction house, and I, uh, I, uh, I started. I like singing. I got it. Summertime and the living is easy. Oh, yeah. 
hips are jumping, oh yeah, and the cotton is high. And you had lots of keynotes like this here happening before, haven't you? Your daddy's rich. Yeah, your daddy's rich. And your mom is good looking. Don't you cry One of these mornings One of these mornings You're gonna rise up Take to the sky But until, until that morning, morning Ain't nothing gonna harm you We'll start with your daddy and mama There's no karaoke here, I'm just speaking and by yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that's Michael Udelson on the piano. Talented guy, amazing. Makes me sound a hundred times better. That's the secret. Just gotta get a good accompanist. Mel doing good out there. Well, Mel having a good time. Participation here. I'm looking at you. Is good looking. So hush, little baby. Take it on free time on my hands, I learned to fly planes. Found a good jacket, said that looks like a pilot's jacket, I think I'll go learn to fly a plane. Uh, that's a little ritual, when they, uh, when, when, when you, I got my pilot, I did my first solo, um, I, I, that, there's actually nobody in the plane, that is a selfie, yes, and there, there's a ritual of uh, call, cutting the tail feathers or something, anyway, they cut off the back of your shirt, that's my instructor, Howard Johnson thrown out of an airplane in World War II when he was 14 years old as an air cadet, went up on a little little introductory flight, the engine on the bomber exploded and went off and hit the tail and they thought they were all going to die so they, he had a parachute on, they kicked open the floor panel, threw the kid out the bottom, but it turned out actually the airplane was okay, it kept flying, it was meant to take lots of damage, they landed and then they had to go find the kid they'd thrown out in the field somewhere. <laughs> That's the kind of guy you want to learn to fly from. <laughs> I uh, got a pilot's license, um, learned to fly different kinds of planes, um, just to make sure the authorities would properly respect me. I got my license signed by Buzz Aldrin and Scott Carpenter. Second. <laughs> what do you mean I'm doing something wrong? They say I'm okay. It's like the pros. 
Well, it does, it does, yes. Uh, yeah, that was the main objection. The problem was when they stopped me, they say, which one are you? <laughs> I don't know, that's Bert Kersey and I must be the other guy. Um, I also uh, decided, well, you know, anything worth doing is worth overdoing, so I got a Mexican pilot's license. Uh, yes, it's real. Um, it's actually, some of, the, some of the exams are tougher than they are here. Here the physical is, the, the doctor just says, well, did you find my office okay? Did you see the sign on the front? I say, yes, I did. Well, your eyesight's just fine. Uh, when you're, you're here, apparently the, the receptionist, when she called your name, did she need to come over and tap you on the shoulder? Did you just stand up and come in? I know I heard her. So, well, then your hearing's just fine. Now the elevator's out. We always turn that off whenever we do a pilot exam. Did you come up the stairs okay? You don't seem to be breathing hard. I say, yes. Well, your heart's fine. Here's your sign off, and you are a pilot. In Mexico, they had me draw pictures of my mother and, and ask questions about whether I think being in a gang and smuggling illegal substances is a good idea. <laughs> I figure if they're asking that question, they're looking for the answer, no. <laughs> but I passed that test, and those are true stories. So I learned to fly all kinds of planes, and, uh, and it was wonderful. Um, I still do. Um, and uh, if this is the bottom one down here. That's the, the Zeppelin uh, Eureka, Airship Eureka, largest airship in the world at the time. Uh, some of my favorites, a uh, World War II trainer. Um, and and it, it is a freaking good picture, I, I admit. I don't deserve the picture. I was looking, when I travel, I just find flying clubs. And I say, hey, can I get an, an instructor and go out and fly? And they have a list. They'll have a Cessna, and they'll have a Cherokee, and I'm, I'm in Palo Alto, ooh, clue. <laughs> and I go down the list, and it's got, well, we've got an SNJ World War II trainer. Okay. I mean, like, flying club, like I can just say, yeah, that one? He goes, yeah, Saturday at 1, okay? I said, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so we went out and, uh, and, and flew around in that, which was, which was very cool. Um, amphibious aircraft, seaplanes, I love seaplanes. Oh yeah, this one's pretty cool. Uh, so I decided for my birthday, I was born on October 10th, 1952. Another karmic moment there. Oh, now you have all my personal information, will steal my identity, but please do, I've got so much to do. I, <laughs> I've got I, everything ready for you. If I steal the identity, it's, it's ready for you. But anyway, so I found a place and somebody asked, they said, you don't just go on the internet and like Google fly a jet plane on Saturday, do you? I said, well, actually you do. But um, So I did, so it was pretty cool. Um, and then I also did, uh, let's see, is that right? All right, no, sorry. And then uh, I also did uh, uh, desert camping, flew into Burning Man. So that's the, the Burning Man lake bed. And Burning Man is just behind me. Um, so the kind of secret thing, we, I still, Hypersea is still sold to schools and it has example projects and this photo, there's a project that, that second graders are looking at at this very moment that just says, desert camping by plane. Be sure to bring along water and you know, all the things you'll need. Uh, and like there's solar panels that I've, I've saran wrapped uh, to the elevators back here so that they're charging this battery so that when I get nervous and it's time to leave and I over crank the motor and the battery dies, there's no AAA for airplanes out in the middle of the Black Rock Desert. So that was one of the things I was worried about. So that was my backup battery for when I screwed up starting the engine when it was time to go home. Fortunately, it started and I didn't need it, but anyway, it makes a nice story in a hyper CO stack for schools. So I just don't mention it's at Burning Man. <laughs> um, so yes, that brings us then to the, to the next chapter. Hold on a minute, you'll, you'll never guess, but I, I just I don't really have an outfit for this one, but it's okay. Let's move along, it's the shtick, right? microphone again. All right, let's see here. I don't have an outfit. Oh, wait, what? Get the tie. Oh, I wore the tie. Oh, yeah, so now we're just back to normal, I guess. All right. Tuck in my shirt. I don't want to keep you waiting. Sweet dreams, no sunbeams find you. Sweet dreams that leave our worries behind you. But in your dreams, whatever they be, dream a little dream of me. All right, we're back. Uh, and no theme. I, just, I don't have anything that goes with a volcano. So. I hope you like the first three acts, though. 
so, so I'm in retirement, and I'm uh, I'm uh, the com eventually a company called Software Mac Kiev acquired Hyper Studio, and they uh, invested quite a bit of money in bringing it back. Um, it exists at this very moment. This presentation was created with it. Um, and it's, um, it's, I guess actually I went and said about there, if I'll even say, software Mac Kiev somewhere in little print. Um, but anyway, so in 2007, they, they, they came to me and said, oh, we want to, we're going to buy it from the people that have it. What they got literally was like a piece of paper with HyperCU written on it and no source code and no nothing. So they had to start completely from scratch. Um, so for the next almost 10 years, um, I worked with them as really just a consultant and designer. Um, one kind of story you might enjoy on that is um, they, they had done like an early prototype. So I wrote up like two or three pages of my comments. Like they had, um, I don't know, just whatever in the menus. And I wrote up all, all this stuff. And I said, well, you know, that's all very nice, but here's, here's what I, here's what I would say suggest you do it. And they, we spent hours going through the list explaining why everything on the list was wrong. And they told me, no, that's nice. But like, for instance, I said, we well, you know we've got to have command greater than and less than go to the next card and previous card. And they said, no, app, that's Apple period. That's for canceling. And I said, when has that ever worked? When have you ever had a frozen computer, anything going on that Apple, command, Apple period ever even worked? And besides that, they look like little arrows, and I like that to go to the next card. And why don't you use the arrows? Because if there's a text field and your cursor's in the middle of the text field and you hit the right arrow, you won't go to the next card. You'll just go to the next character. So uh, anyway, we ended the conversation with, a, with a, a story. I said, you know, Willie Nelson sings over the rainbow, and Judy Garland does it much better. And he's, his guitar has a hole in it. I think he's, if he's not missing some of his teeth, he's, he certainly isn't the prettiest man to ever look at. And yet, all sorts of people buy his albums. So that's kind of like what Roger Wagner's Hyper Studio will be, if you wish. Everything you said is totally true. Your list of why all my ideas are crazy are totally valid. But if you want it to be somebody else's hyper studio, then that'll be just fine. But if you want to be Roger Wagner's hyper studio, then it'll be kind of like Willie Nelson's over the rest, over the restroom, over the top of the <laughs> rainbow. <laughs> hmm. The lipo batteries are going, hold on. <laughs> um, so anyway, so, but we worked it out and I had artistic, pretty much our total artistic command um, over hyper studio for the next nine years. And it turned out, it is the Jedi lightsaber of of what it does. There is nothing in the category. So I use it every day. I keep track of online accounts. I build things. I do image manipulation. It does green screen and geotags. You can take a photo with your phone, email it to me. When I drop it on the screen in Hyper Studio, when I click on it, it'll open Google Maps to where the photo was taken. That's just part of what it does. Um, if I drag something from Safari and there's an image there, and I say, oh, gee, where did that come from? Then I could. Um, click on that, go to comments and attributions, and I'd have the link from where that was downloaded. And if I were to control click on it, then it would open a browser to that web page. But that happens automatically. I didn't, I didn't have, that just flowed. And I could take a, a folder full of images and just drop it on the icon and it would lay them all out. And if there were movies in there, then it would automatically set them up so that the movies played on those cards. Um, and if I had a, a button or an image and I wanted it to go somewhere else, I could just drag the something onto that image. And if it was an app, it would do it. Creative Commons is um, a way of sharing images and almost no software supports actually putting the attributions in for every media element. HyperCU does. So it's not so much a, a pitch for HyperCU as just say it exists and for the very small number of people, about equal to the number of people who use the trial size toolbox um, or the routine machine, um, there are, there's still a university in New York that teaches it and the occasional Jedi Knight that you can find quietly passing with unusual powers. <laughs> so anyway, so, uh, so, so, uh, so in the midst of my retirement, um, I heard about the Arduino and an idea, another idea occurred. Those are the, those are the four, four very dangerous words. Most is a big word, but we'll say very dangerous. I have an idea. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, 
the two most dangerous words are having your pilot say, watch this. <laughs> uh, the three worrisome words are when your pilot says, what's that noise? <laughs> Uh, but in any event, um, I had an idea, which was to use um, Hyper Studio and use it to connect to traditional school projects where a kid makes a volcano or a, a diorama. And the idea would be that you could, could touch a button on the model and it would light up an LED and then play some media with Hyper Studio. And the Ar Ar how many people know what an Arduino is? Wow, I got, you'd think I was in like a, a techie kind of place. People of unusual technical skills. Um, whoa, oh sorry, it's time to hit, sorry, I forgot. Hold on, back to chapter four. There we are. So, so for, the, for the two people in the room that aren't quite sure what Arduino is, it's, it's basically a little controller on a board that's very neat. It has 12 inputs. It's got or outputs and inputs. It's got some analog things that you could monitor temperature, pressure, um, anything with a variable value to it. It can be programmed. It has this would fit right into your skill set. It has a 32k of memory, <laughs> of which some chunk is already used for important things, not your program. So I think you're down to 28k or something of, of usable. Chris is an expert in the, the Arduino. He's been we have been working on this in secret uh, for some time now. Um, you can connect the USB cable to the computer so the computer can talk to this guy. And so with that, you could have something where um, when you touch a button, the light comes on in the model. Now this was the first type Arduino, and as, as now I have established with a long tradition of excellent ideas, I thought it would be different from everybody else, and instead of having a button, I would use a photo cell <coughs> as the touch point on the model, because I didn't want to have a button that knocked the model over. Um, so the first Hyperduino, uh, so this is what the back of a model would look like, and that's a prototype. So this is the first, so I don't know anything about birthing no circuit boards. Where else could I tell that joke? Uh, but I tell people I, I channel Forrest Gump, not Elon Musk. So I, some people tell me I should pay more for my channel subscription. Um, but, but in any event, I was, I was trying to figure out this problem. I said, you know, the Arduino, the first thing, I actually showed this model at an educational conference, there were 200 people in the room who loved the idea, Hyper Studio Interactive Model. How do I do it? I sent them all emails on Amazon about where to buy the breadboard and all the resistors. Um, and crickets, nobody ever wrote to me again. They said, Roger who? They don't want to do this sort of stuff. You guys like it, but the average fourth grade librarian is not looking at this to make her day, to make a diorama light up. So Forrest Gump said, well, Roger, why don't you just take the lid from a box of chocolates? And if every Arduino project uses the same 12 resistors, why don't you just put those resistors on the lid and then they'll just always be there? I said, Forest, 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 a box of chocolates is an Arduino. He said, Roger, Roger, don't you remember the Whitman sampler in the grocery store? It's only got four chocolates. That's the size you need for an Arduino. I said, well, now I think you have a point there. So the chocolate thing, uh, I, I, I took a, the next step. I, I purchased a, for a whole $5 an Arduino prototype board, which just has a lot of holes in it. Went on Amazon, bought, bought some connectors here and some resistors, and, and laid out the concept for just a shield, a piggyback board that goes on an Arduino that has the 12 resistors that every project uses. You say that's, that's like way too simple. When's the impressive part come? It reminds me of a question. Somebody said, Roger, aren't you afraid somebody will steal your idea? <laughs> I said, let me tell you, no engineer in his right mind would lower himself to something so trivial and embarrassing as this project, which I'm about to embark on. So that, that's it. So I did the prototype, and, uh, and, and, it, and then I worked on it. That's my kitchen table, the, the, fam the world famous, as you heard of them, the prototypes here. <laughs> I follow very sterile procedures for all. <laughs> no contamination, no little bits of metal that could somehow find their way into an important connecting part or switch. Um, so uh, this, is, this is the connector that went in those little slots. And for the, uh, the analog inputs, I decided to use a little trim pot that I could, could vary, do a little adjustment. So, so that became, and that was my little test ground work area. Um, and so that was in 2015. 
And so, oh, back to the photo cells. So then I came back the next year to the conference with now the photo cells and my little piggyback board. And uh, I went to do a presentation and they turned out the lights. <laughs> so now there was no light to block for the model and all the sensors thought they were being touched. So fortunately, kind people ran up with their iPhones and it was kind of like a rock concert. So they all, you know, <laughs> a rescue mission or something. They all shown their little thousands of iPhones on the model and then I could demonstrate it. But it, 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 it did eventually get the message that it wouldn't work. So I eventually went to touch sensors and capacitive touch sensing. Um, in Hyper Studio, there's actual Arduino watcher. So Hyper Studio worked with it, but eventually we went on to make a Chrome app. Um, but to just give you an idea here. Hello everybody, and today we are going to make the photo cell go to the sun. So I will be pushing that arrow, pushing. So he's going to edit the stack button. in Hyper Studio on an invisible button. Arduino watcher. And this is second grade. The sun. The sun is A2. So there's analog input, so he's going to the analog input of the Arduino. If it's not on yours, then. Oh, well. <laughs> Great instructional thing. And then you push on analog. So now the light, the, in fact, in you can morning, see right above it, it says 174, 166. So it's just the, the photo cell kind of floating. You know, maybe something else, but works for us. And then, turn green. Yes, it does. Now turn red. So it gives real-time feedback while the students are putting in their, their values for the analog. Green, red. Okay. Now. We are going to try and do this the right way. There's so many alternatives. And ta-da! So on the screen and on the computer here, touching that sensor brought up, you know, this was a kindergarten class where every kid did a different planet. Um, so the idea of it actually is exceedingly simple, is just to be able to take any physical input and ultimately using a Chrome browser, not Hyper Studio, because not all schools have Hyper Studio um, anymore, is in a Chrome browser, anything on the internet um, can be linked to an, to an input. And so, um, just to follow that theme for a moment, uh, I mentioned with Hyper Studio, every, every program has a this fundamental data, data layer to it. And so on the Hyperduino, the flow that I use um, are URLs. So the whole idea is, so this, this is what a, not that you can see it all that well, but we can pass one around. That's what the Hyperduino board looks like now, kind of the same size. It's a piggyback board that goes on a standard Arduino that's programmable with a number of environments. It's, it's, uh, I, I, f I struggle with the Arduino IDE, but there are block programming languages that you can use. Um, so when this board goes on there, its sole purpose is to just make it easier to connect to anything, including capacitive touch sensing. And then the USB cable connects to a browser. So now, th and this is the key idea, is that any physical condition, this isn't the Internet of Things I'm about to describe, by the way, so don't leap to that. It's a measurement or something in the real world can be made into a bookmark. So touching that and blocking the light says go to this web page, or touching a sensor and getting this particular reading. So for example, if we were to, and I won't go into this very far, but just once we're, once we're down the road. All right, so that's, <clears throat> that's what it looks like, <clears throat> is there's some web page over here and there's just a list of conditions. So you could say, oh, for an analog input, I'm going to look for a certain range, exactly what he was doing in Hyper Studio. We're just doing in the Chrome browser with an extension. But the idea is that anything in the physical world that can be measured can be associated with a URL, <clears throat> which means, for instance, you could do a diagnostic device that when you put two probes in here, that reading you would expect. You'd say, well, if it's this value, I want to give this information. If it's a different value, I'll play a different video to tell the person what they should have done. And that value alone is associated with the URL. And it's, it's a different kind of flow than writing, you know, writing a program or having content that's all embedded in your tutorial. 
And then the other thing is the reverse direction works. As you step through a web page or imagine like a PowerPoint or, or Google Slides, as you go from URL to URL and that's changing, you can program that to say, oh, turn on LEDs, do actions. So you could have a, a video on, on YouTube that has a URL and a time count. And as you were explaining a servo arm, how, how an arm moved, a person would construct that, plug it into their computer, and when it got to that part, the arm would move. And if you actually paused and moved it back, the arm would go back to where it was. <laughs> so anything in the physical world can be a consequence of a URL, and a URL can be a consequence of anything in the physical world. And we were discussing this morning, now that the Apple II has a browser, there's really no good reason at all that Chris Torrance shouldn't have dedicate every last waking hour of his moment working with his favorite friends. <laughs> so anyway, so that's, that, is, that, is, that is what I'm doing now. Hold on, let's get rid of that, let's get rid of that, go back to that. So there, why have a garage when you've got a living room? <laughs> so how many of you said you were entrepreneurs? I, might recognize this then. So that's, that's the living room, that's the other direction. Um, I, and uh, let's see, oh, earlier we, I think we had, oh, that's the kitchen. And you saw the kitchen table. So you're saying, is there actually any living area left? No, not really. Uh, I have, the, the amazing thing I've learned is that three years ago, I didn't know, I didn't really didn't know anything about anything. And what I, how many people remember the movie Net with Sandra Bullock where she orders a pizza? Okay, so in that time, most of you are too, too young for that, but there's a movie in the ancient times uh, when people were first hearing about computers where, where Sandra Bullock, who's uh, I think in an old folks home now, uh, but anyway, she, you know, she's, a, she's a computer person and she's brilliant and she orders a pizza from her computer. And that's the opening wow scene. That's like James Bond, you know, like escaping the villains with something miraculous. Uh, so I, I feel kind of like that in that I sat at my desk and I said, gee, I wonder where to get a UPC code. And I Googled where to get UPC code, and I, and I did, and it showed me. But then I said, well, where will I get these circuit boards made? But I was on Kickstarter, and somebody said, we're waiting for our prototypes from Seed Studio in China. So I'd heard about the Google. I put in Seed Studio China, up pops this whole page, it's this boutique concierge of, of prototype makers. And they said, well, you know, it's going to cost 25 bucks to make one of those. Holy moly, like just one? Um, and I found they will just make anything. So I'm, three years later, I have custom cables made. I have circuit boards made. The, the Hyperduino I held up was, was the kind of simple one. Um, I've got now a whole family of these things. Hold on, family. There we are. Um, whole family of these things. Uh, this one's got robotic uh, motor controller and terminals for robotics in it. And nothing would please me more than to have the Apple II community that I love so dearly uh, discover how to leverage the things that I build and, and the things that they do and love. Um, so, so that's that. Well, that's what I'm doing now. Um, there's supposed to be an exciting conclusion, but I, I did well enough to get the slides together. But uh, I'll say thank you for all of your, your patience and endurance with the songs and entertainment and stories. And it's a joy to be back. Oh, very bad, very bad. Oh, even though that's a walking of it. But thank you very much. And I and I do have so I was going to put my sweater back on, and I'll even have it around for the next couple days. And so if you want to get a souvenir picture that looks like it was taken in 1978, uh, I'm, I'm very accommodating. Oh, the other thing is for those who have used Hyper Studio, um, only because if you're a oh if you're a collector, that reminds me two kinds of collectors. This is the overflow time. So the uh, the one thing is. Chris and I, when he first did the book, said he needed a picture, so I just sent him a picture. So there's a, there was a small number of me that have me in the, in, the, in the plane, which is a cool picture, but now we have the Waz picture. So the Waz picture is highly desirable, but if you're the kind of person that likes to have one of each thing in a complete edition for historical purposes, I'm sure none of you would fall in that category, but if you did happen to, 
I brought a couple that I would, I would part with for $10, and the only reason it's 10 is so that you don't just take it because it's free and then forget it about it forever. <laughs> so the $10 is only a token of, of your really wishing to have such a crazy thing. We have other ones. Oh, right, sorry. And then, oh, then there's the little thing of the new ones of which we have an endless supply, but yes. Uh, and these are all available for autographing at, at your leisure and uh, uh, whatever. So this is same book, just just different picture on the back, I think, right? Yep. Just change the picture. Twenty dollars. Twenty bucks. So you can get the first edition, highly collectible for ten, <laughs> or the, the 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 great picture of Waz and me for twenty, which is still a great deal, and uh, and no extra charge for personalization. <laughs> uh, let's see. Did we cover everything? Oh no, there was one. The the last thing is, if you are a hyper studio kind of person and and really think the digitizer card is super cool, then then see me personally. As my mother said, no, I didn't bring enough for everyone. But if someone were to come to me and say, I love hyper studio and that digitizer board was really cool, I might have something for you. So with that cryptic message and my great appreciation, uh, go forth and and assemble. <laughs> The freedom to assemble. Can we do questions and answers? Oh, yes, of course we can do questions and answers. <gasps> there, there are even questions. All right, let's go to this guy. No. Uh, how many entrants were there in the bizarre contest? Just one. Please repeat the question. Yeah, how many? Oh, so, hold on. I, I just made that up to mess with you. Uh, the question was, how many entrants were there in the bizarre question? And do you have any stories about it? Uh, I do. I, it's funny I do. So, so you had entered the... Yeah, when I was 12. When he was 12, we have an entrant, and Forrest over there was an entrant. And I have to say, one of my regrets in life was that I, after we did the contest, I sent them all to John Baynard, and I assume he or his wife threw them out one day, whereas I would have kept them forever in a sacred altar. Um, but, but I got all kinds, like, like, like huge amounts of work. Like they weren't just a piece of paper with, here's the translation. Um, there, some people did like a whole recreation of the package. Um, so you, it looked like the package, but now it was all translated. Um, and so, the, so, but I, I did, I did, it was, a, it was an Apple II for the prize. So we did it officially by putting all the names in a hat and pulling one out. Um, and then do I have any other stories? The other story that was kind of neat was considering the complete lack of success with the marketing campaign due to certain choices. Um, was somebody wrote and said, I'm doing a book on cryptography. Can I, can I put a screenshot of your program in it? And I, well, of course you can, and that's, that's kind of neat. So somewhere there are NSA agents studying alien script to <laughs> protect our nation. Did, didn't somebody send you a letter written in the script? Oh, you're right. How did you remember? How do you know? That was a tool. I was a oh, I, I, I spilled the beans on the of it. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds familiar now. Yes, and I, and I did translate it. It's coming back to me now. So that I probably still have. I probably no, no, did not send that. I probably did not send that to John. That was an excellent question. Now, you had a question. Oh, uh, and I'll, then we're some over here. I'll, I'll preface this by saying that I've often told people that my favorite game of all time is Assembler, and more specifically, Merlin and its variants. Oh, uh huh. Um, and of course, Glenn has passed, but I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about how you, how you met him and, and uh, oh. how you guys hooked up and started. Yeah, question is Glenn, Glenn Breeden stories um, and Merlin and how did all that happen? Well, remember, so the very beginning is remember I wanted to um, uh, be a publisher. So I said I was going to start publishing other people's things. And along, and so about that time, Call Apple was publishing Big Mac. No, that was the macro program. So what was their name for their version yeah, of Merlin? It was, Big Mac. It was called Big Mac? Yeah. Okay, so what was the one? That, oh, PLE was the, the line yeah. editor. Okay, right. So they were doing big... It's also confusing because then there was a Macintosh that came later. You see why I bring it? It's so messed it's up. Confusing. So anyway, they did Big Mac, so I didn't remember at least correctly. So I was, you know, trolling for software, for product to publish. So I called Glenn and said, hey, how about if we do this commercially? And he said, okay. Um, and so that was, you know, basically how that started. Um, and so the company for those 10 years before the, uh, the reset, the government induced reset occurred, um, was I wanted to be a utilities you know, company and do programming tools, because that's what I like doing. Um, I, like, I like that stuff. I didn't like, you know, I, didn't, I didn't have a big desire to do even games, but I didn't really understand how to do games either. They, it seemed like a dark art to me. And the only other story, which is not meant to be in any way disrespectful of St. Glenn, but it's the only other story I have, is one day I, was, I found myself in Princeton. 
Uh, actually, I think there was a Hyper Studio user uh, group having an event there, and I find myself in Princeton, where Glenn was based, and I call him up and say, Glenn, it's been all these years, we've never met, I'm at Princeton's, I'm down at the, the whatever tavern it is, you know, I'd like to get together, and he goes, I'm busy right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just say he was a very private man. So I've never had the pleasure of meeting him, but I know he used to go up to the mountains because when we would send him things in the summer, it was always a strange address. You know, I don't know if it was the Yosemite or the Redwoods, but it was you know the end of some you know fourth tree, you know, cardboard box nailed to fourth tree on Dead Dog Road or something. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but he did great work. He was just just very intense. He was a math professor, yeah. as I recall. That's what I've heard. yeah. So it's in the front of the Maryland Manual. Yeah, it was. Oh, okay, yeah, so, it's, yeah, so that sounds right. And Princeton would be a good place to be a math professor. There are some hands over here. I hope you haven't forgotten them. Yes? There's a small observation that your, your lens carpet looks like a breadboard. What's that? Your lens carpet looks like a breadboard. My lens? Your lens carpet. Yeah, right. living room. Oh, uh, so oh, oh yes, yes, yes. That's handy. Yeah, yeah, it's. Um, it, it, it has been interesting. One, I, I am. This is, by the way, I have close to being no thought goes unspoken, which I, so I just sort of a stream of semi consciousness. But I like the hacking, but I have to actually constantly be bring myself back to recognizing that not everybody likes the wires. Um, so I know I, I can't. I, it seems totally bizarre to me, but uh, but anyway, but I but I have to keep doing that. But yes, I love the. But I'm not an intense engineer. You know, I'm one of the reasons. I, I, my other joke is the reason Hyper Studio and things have to be easy to use is because I go off the rails quite easily, in terms of my own confusion or or just impatience. If a computer takes more than five seconds to do something, I, I might kind of done waiting. But but yes, thank you for the lovely. I, I, look, I'll take that as a compliment on how I keep there my house. There is no work being done in the tech you work. Ah, there you go. That's what I will tell everybody from now on. There's no work being done in a tidy workshop. Well, hold on. Now, I, like, you're, well, there's a hand back there. Yes, sir. The history guy, right? Uh, did Apple help hinder or were they irrelevant in your development and marketing of... Uh, oh, good question. So, yeah, and that, that depends on which, which year we're asking the question, but there's some stories there. The question is, was Apple a help or hindrance? So one, in my long stream of excellent business decisions, I thought I could move to Cupertino and become part of Apple Computer. But I think I'll make a lot more money with my own business, that whole part of a pie thing. Um, so that was the first thing. Apple was, in general, cooperative, you know, I would say, especially in the, in the early days. Um, Steve Wozniak wrote the, the little Sweet 16 article. And you know, personally, as always, but we still talk from time to time. So I mean, still a wonderful person. Um, Apple Computer. I snagged a couple of the A plus insiders that had HyperCard GS on um, on the cover, and there was a story there where they announced HyperCard GS like a, six months or a year before they actually would, knew they were going to be able to ship it. And I said, I've got Hyper Studio GS. I'm going out working really hard. Uh, to promote your product, and you're going to announce something that's going to put me out of business. Uh, and I wrote a letter to John Scully, and they actually answered back and said, you're right, we're, we're going to turn that down until it's actually out. So go figure. Um, and so, yeah, I would say, and then in general, I had a couple philosophies as a business with Hyper Studio. One of them was at the moment of, uh, I called it a prime directive, which, okay, I, I I don't even have to open my, open my eyes, but gee, how many of you know what the prime directive is? <laughs> so I'm not going to dignify that by raising my hand. Of course I know what it is. It's violated in every episode. <laughs> and if you don't know what I'm talking about, just ask the person next to you. So it's at, at uh, Hyper Studio Land, we had a prime directive that said, at the moment of contact with an outside entity, because it has to sound like that, it be a prime directive. At the moment of contact with an outside entity, we work for them. 
which meant that when we talked to Apple, we tried to figure out how to, you know, bring them a benefit. If we talked to a teacher, how do they do better in a classroom? So they did Pioneer. So some, when they had Laserdisc, they would have a new model Laserdisc. We didn't say, you know, call us when you sold 100,000 units. We'd say, oh, it's going to be showed for the, you know, shown for the first time in two weeks. I'll have the programmers put a driver in for it so you can show it. Um, and that worked out, that worked out really nice. Um, so with Apple, there were things where, like, they were going to go somewhere and they needed a demo disc, and and so so we, we literally put a person on a plane with all of the demo discs or whatever it was that they needed in their lap. It wasn't even like in baggage or anything because they said, well, there's no way you can get there, you know. And then it was another time. Oh, they had a CD they were going to do of demo things, and they said, well, you only have two weeks. There's no way you can do it in two weeks. So in 12 days, we had <laughs> CDs with what they needed, you know. So it. And then another time, a school called and said, uh, by that time, Hyperspeed was doing pretty good. And they said, we're New York, I think, city schools. And they said, Apple called and said, we have an order from, or a bid we have to compete on from New York City schools. And it says there has to be so, much, so many megabytes of RAM, and it has to be this speed, and it has to include Hyperstudio. So, and Compaq was bundling Hyperstudio. And it turned out Apple was, too, by that time. Um, so it was a bid for like 30,000 computers. Um, so we could have like held, you know, like twisted the knife or something on Apple and said, "Well, now that you have no negotiating position, the price is twice whatever you paid yesterday." Um, but I said, "No, you, you know, whatever your whatever the price was on these units, that's what it'll be on this other one." So it was. So anyway, they, yeah, they were. I would say the main thing that my as a preference, I like working with small companies, not big ones, like Google right now. For I mean, Apple and Google. Well, Apple and Microsoft have sort of traded karmic places in the universe. Right, so now Apple's big, so they don't need to like you. Microsoft is worried, so they're friendlier. <laughs> um, and then Google's so big, they really don't care. I'm sorry for the recording, but anyway, my, you know, like I, like at some point, the the app just failed because Google had just turned off file saving. So you know, you in Hyperduino, you're trying to make a project and save it, and then all of a sudden there's an update that says, no, we we don't believe in saving files anymore, you know, locally. Um, and so there's nobody to call. This, like at some point, I w I'd shown them something really great, um, like a titration, and the answer was thanks for sharing. So the problem is, whatever the company is, it's not a personal attribute of Google, but whatever the biggest company is, there's a weird sort of thing. Well, any company that's really big is successful, so clearly they don't need your help. <laughs> right? um, so I tend to not chase after people who don't need my help, because the prime direct. By the way, the prime directive says, remember, we work for them, which means that if we are not of service, the business card in Invisible Ink says, we who are of the order of, the ancient order of those who serve. And so, and so there are actually concepts of agency uh, and service that say part of serving is to know that if you're not of service, you need to get out of the way. And so our tech support people had all the contact information for the other companies, like Digital Chisel and Empower and you know whoever, PowerPoint. And the idea was that they weren't, that list wasn't there for competitive analysis. It was there as much to say, oh, I recognize at this moment you really need this other product. And by the way, here's the phone number, and here's how to get in touch with them, and be sure to ask them for this add-on to their product, because that's the one you really need. <coughs> a long answer to a short, a short question. Yes, sir? Yeah. Do you see value in retro computing for higher education, or combining your Okay, now you realize I absolutely cannot resist the urge to get tarred and feathered. Now, I think retro computing is like totally a bad idea, and I don't think anybody, I think the, the latest stuff is what everybody should have. <laughs> Why are they locking the doors? Uh, so, uh, hold on, I can, so I can give them the real. Are we time up? No. Oh, okay, just stretching. Uh, no, actually, the, I'll just say the. Rather than opinion, I, I work with, like, if it's not the University of Virginia, I've got to remember where it's at. Uh, but anyway, they teach 6502 programming. And, and the thing about, I, I would just say, forget whether it's retro or not, this is very non opaque. You can see, you can actually see the 6502. It's, it's not like an electron microscope thing. You can actually see pictures and with your eye. Um, and I've seen simulations where everything actually lights up while it's writing a program. And, and so there's a, even on things like the Hyperduino, to me, because I, I, fundamentally I'm also an educator. Yeah. 
And so to me, that's a constant struggle of how much is opaque but more efficient, how much is not opaque but at the price of efficiency. So, so I, I think you know, there are schools that do that. And that's who was here um, with the Apple One um, saying that there were clients that used the Apple One uh, reproduction as a class project for, for you know, computer engineering courses because you can build it. You can, at the end, they know. And frankly, when I learned to fly, that guy, Howard Johnson, um, Howard Johnson, sorry, that's not his name, that's the restaurant, Howard Jackson, <laughs> um, Howard Jackson said he wanted me to learn in a Cessna 150 because he said, you will feel the airplane. You'll hear the air going over every surface, and you'll learn to fly an airplane. You see, if you learn in something, even a 172 that has power, you'll think that engine power gets you out of problems, which when the engine doesn't work, won't. <laughs> um, and it turned out to be true. I really loved that feeling. And so I, I like, so for instance, the Raspberry Pi. I'm not a big fan of the Raspberry Pi in the sense that the Arduino I can get my head around. I, I, I think I've already divulged. I get confused easily, even when I was young. I would say, oh, I have a question, another one for you. And then sooner or later, we'll have the subtle clue that it's time to go, like getting the green bag out of the box. Um, but I would stare at the Apple II for hours and then days on, on a bug. And the only thing that kept me going was that I always eventually figured it out. But, but, but at some point, it's kind of odd to be there, you know, 36 hours in and still have no clue. And then the part that drove me crazy was the zero, zero, one problem of, and I'll try to tell this quickly, but you, uh, I'll get it wrong. But you've got, you want to put some posts in for a fence. And uh, I'll forget the fence for a minute. How much is six divided by three? And it, uh, it, it's two, right? So now you're going to put in a fence and how many, and then you want them two feet apart. So how many fence posts do you need? Four, I think. Three. Anyway, the brother, the, 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 I may have the thing, but in the interest of time, I'll just say there, there's a thing you can go through where it's divide six by something or eight by two. Now you're going to build a fence. How many do you need? But now you've got a bookcase. How many shelves do you need? And it all comes down to, in a way, variance on starting on whether you count from zero or one. Do you start on zero or one? It's so like in a, in, to make it really a, a four next loop. I was only getting screwed up because I wanted to do something ten times. So if I go from 0 to 9, did it really work? But I did 0 to 9, and it's still broken. And now that goes away. And I would be in like in this weird little tornado loop for just horrible suffering for days. But eventually, I figured it out. So my question for you, though, is once in a while, I would find a bug that when I fixed it and I realized what I'd done wrong, I'm serious in this, the question was, why did it ever work in the first place? <laughs> it wasn't that I finally found the edge condition. It was, hey, now the mis that should never have worked. <laughs> it should never ever. It, it wasn't it like it was, it was just like that, and it was like some weird like those theories that the universe is being invented around us as we study it. You know, it was kind of like that where I wondered where there's something weird with stuff. Yes, question or just more yeah, stretching? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think the tape ran out, didn't it? <laughs> I mean, excellent question. It's uh, HyperCO uh, in general is owned by Software Mac Kiev, but let me just say they're a great company to work with, and I have a feeling, a very strong feeling, that they would be totally happy to work out something like Glenn's uh, estate with Merlin. I see no reason why HyperCO GS shouldn't be available to anybody with an interest in it. Yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about the right choice that oh, you wrote? Yeah, actually, and I, I gave it, but yeah, the, the right choice was, at one point it was under the name of the correspondent, and then it was called the right, so it's the same program, and it really was the same idea of, of discovering that, that screen memory with text, you know, is readable. So now if you just imagine a giant buffer that your, that your screen is just scrolling through, except the screen's not moving, I'm just using that move command from 1978. So I spent years of my life and energy on the right choice and the correspondent and loved it because it was super fast, right? So you're not, I'm not rendering any fonts. There's nothing, it's just, it's as, you know, talk about transparent and non-opaque. And actually MouseWrite then was based on that. So MouseWrite, yeah, so then the story of MouseWrite was after we ran into our financial difficulties, 
um, or actually I guess it was right before. Before we had the financial difficulty we were when we thought, you know, we we're trying to survive, uh, we thought we need to do like a real program. And Apple had just come out with the mouse. So the idea was, oh, we'll be the first word processor, you know, that uses a mouse. So I think it was. Um, and so it's a derivative of the right choice. Oh. So the code is, you know, the, the code, the core structure is the same. You've got a window on, on your code. It just had more, more further work put into it. The, the lesson for entrepreneurs that I learned is what the phrase I call, you can't make people eat their vegetables. Um, what that meant was I could give you a very rational explanation for why the right choice and mouse right were more. I wrote actually the second GS book, assembly language, for the Apple II GS, I wrote with mouse right. Um, it was super fast and had a big, you know, lot, big checklist of reasons why that was a good idea. It turned out the other company that did whatever the program was, Graphic Writer, that everything was rendered in high res and you had two pages of text total, and it was really slow. They sold like 30,000 copies. I mean, they sold you know huge numbers of their product. And what I found was you, that's, you can't make people eat their vegetables. Right choice, mouse right might have been better from a productivity standpoint, but seeing bold and bold is what people wanted, regardless of whether it actually worked or not. Um, so I have to remember that today, even with the things I'm working on now, is there's stuff that's really cool that you know should be educationally sound. I mean, that's one of the things about education is um, I'm not a total believer in free-range education, like just put kids in a room and come back a year later and they'll, they'll rediscover relativity. I, I believe in the idea of a sensei, that a master teacher is actually a valuable talent. That, and educate actually means educare to lead. So anyway, button B7. All right, another hand, and I'm well, sure did, I've worn you out. Did, Chef, did you have anything else that you were going to ask? Uh, I was just going to ask if I can arrange with you to coordinate on pinging software back. Yes, yeah, yeah, consider it done. Yeah, yeah no, can I'm actually going to email you. Yes, no, absolutely. And there was something else we were going to ask him, too. Chris, what were we going to ask him? We'll remember later. But there was something else. Your name came up already once today. All right, I thank you. I applaud you for your patience. Uh, and in this room, it seems to be getting warmer, but maybe it's just me. Well, the last um, thing we wanted to oh, do we'll is do? Yes. our tradition here is when we have our keynote speakers, we like to present them with really the Apple II Forever wow. Award. Do it on mine, because I guess you could send it to me or something, but here, do it on mine, hold on. Make that work. Here, come, come here. You're, 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 you're the high priest, but no, they'll think I just, hold on. They'll think I just made this in my basement. <laughs> Again. Well, thank you. That, and it's in color. Wow, what a fun. Well, that's very nice. That's a very, very much appreciated. And let me just say it's a great honor to be here for this special anniversary. Um, it's, uh, it, it's absolutely wonderful. Thank you all very much. Thank you again. Go forth and assemble.